podcast series. I'm your instructor, Brian Krauss, and today we're going to begin Chapter 5, Part 1, which introduces the atmospheric pressure and wind. In this mini lecture, like all mini lectures, I'm not going to cover all topics or ideas presented in the text. Rather, my aim is to highlight a few key ideas and discuss them in a bit more detail. In this lecture podcast, I've included concept checks in the form of non-graded quizzes at the end. When you get to the quiz slide, right-click the mouse and select Pause, which will pause the narrative PowerPoint. This will allow you time to answer the question. Once you have answered the question, right-click the mouse and select Resume, which will restart the PowerPoint. The following slide is provide, will provide a correct answer and an explanation. If you're watching this as a video, you don't need to right-click the mouse. Simply use the controls at the bottom of the video to navigate. On that note, let's jump in. So our learning outcomes for this uh, lecture are, one, you should be defining, be able to define what air pressure is. You should be able to describe the forces acting on wind and how they affect wind direction and speed. Describe the three cell global wind circulation model. And finally, describe the upper air circulation system. So atmospheric pressure, or air pressure, is the force exerted by the weight of a call of air above a particular location. To conceptualize this notion of air pressure, imagine a sealed container full of air, as shown in figure one here. When the molecules of air collide with the inside surfaces of the container, they exert a pressure. And the amount of pressure they exert depends on the number of collisions that occur between the molecules and the inside surface of this container. So we can change the pressure in two ways. First, we can increase the density of air by either putting more air molecules into the container or reducing the volume of the container, as illustrated here in the, in the uh, next two pictures of figure one. Secondly, we can increase the temperature of the air, and this is kind of indicated by this little red flame below the far right image, to make the molecules move faster, and thus they're going to collide more often with the slides. Therefore, changes in air pressure can come about by changes in the air density or temperature. In Figure 2, this plastic bottle was sealed at approximately 14,000 feet uh, in the altitude, and it was crushed by the increasing atmospheric pressure. At 9,000 feet is the second image, and then at 1,000 feet as it was brought down towards sea level. So atmospheric pressure uh, with an in is measured with an instrument called a barometer. Uh, at average sea level pressure is 1,013.25 millibars. And air pressure decreases as one moves up through the atmosphere because the length of the column of air uh, above you shortens and hence there is less mass above a given location. So if there's less mass above a given location, therefore it's going to be um, exerting less pressure. So meteorologists have a variety of ways to visualize weather data, a map being the most common. And you've seen probably these maps quite often in the newspaper or on the evening news. So to analyze pressure patterns, there's a constant height map that's often used. The constant height map shows the distribution of pressure at sea level. These isobars, there's a line of connecting the points of equal air pressure, are used to show pressure patterns in constant height maps. So here we can look at this map and you see these iso lines in green. And so these are lines that are connecting points of equal air pressure. So the spacing of the isobars indicates the change in pressure over distance, otherwise known as a pressure gradient. So in this map, the spacing between each isobar is 4 millibars, which is indicated in the map legend on the lower right-hand side. So we can cause a change in pressure over distance by the unequal heating of the Earth's surface. And this can be done when one location receives more incoming energy than another, possibly because one place uh, has a higher sun angle than the other. Heating the air in one place causes it to rise off the surface, promoting low pressure with the pressure increasing away from that location. Uh, the creation of a pressure gradient initially causes the air to flow from high towards low pressure, creating a wind. And wind is defined as the horizontal air movement. 
And wind speed is determined by the pressure gradient, which is indicated by the spacing between the bars, you know, these isobars. So where isobars are closer together, the pressure gradient is steep and the wind speed is high. Where isobars are far apart, the pressure gradient is gentle and the wind speed is low. So higher wind speeds can be seen here in the northeastern portion of the U.S. and Canada in this map, and low wind speeds over the four corners, which are Utah, Idaho, Arizona, and New Mexico. So I'm not going to devote time in this lecture to uh, develop to uh, the concept of development of wind patterns. It's an important concept that you should read over in your textbook, and it starts at the bottom of page 99. And it's going to end with the discussion on friction on page 101. So you should have a general understanding of what's going on uh, with wind development. So the next thing I want to look at is anticyclones. And the high pressure center is known as an anticyclone. An anticyclone is produced by a large mass of descending air, which means that the air is very stable and atmospheric pressure is high. In addition, Winds associated with an anticyclone are usually very light, if present at all, and especially close to the center of the high pressure system. Uh, there's very, usually not much wind. Uh, subsidence of warm warms the air by compression, so we're going to have warm, warm air in these anticyclone areas. Any clouds present will quickly evaporate as the temperature of the air rises above its dew point. For this reason, anticyclones usually bring uh, dry and settled weather, particularly in the summer, so you have nice days. Uh, anticyclones move, but not quite in the same purposeful way as traveling cyclones. They nudge their way into position and can be uh, increasingly stubborn about leaving, perhaps persisting for weeks in diverging cyclones to different routes. Uh, such persistent um, anticyclones are known as kind of blocking hives. In winter, they can lead to these long spells of very cold weather, especially if the airflow comes from uh, Russia and Siberia. In the summer, they can lead to these long hot spells and sometimes droughts. So, for example, this last summer we just had is we had, um, or the summer we're still in, depending on when you're listening to this, this PowerPoint, um, we had some serious high pressures coming in and we had temperatures in the, in the 100s that we normally wouldn't have in Boise. Cyclones, on the other hand, a cyclone is simply an area of low pressure around which the winds flow counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. A cyclone center is the area of lowest atmospheric pressure in the region, and that's indicated usually on a map with the letter L, as you can see here. So that's going to have the lowest pressure right there in the center. So regions of rising air are called cyclones. Uh, these are a system of closed isobars, lines of constant pressure, surrounding a region of relatively low pressure. Uh, cloudy conditions, windy weather, rain and snow, and unsettled, unsettled changeable weather are often associated with regions uh, experiencing a low pressure. A low pressure system or cyclone develops when a relatively warm and moist air rises from the surface of the Earth. Air near the center of a low pressure system is uh, said to be very unstable. As the warm humid air spirals upward, it cools and clouds form. Uh, this may be a thick enough to give rain or snow. In these low pressure systems, the air spirals inward at the Earth's surface. If the pressure is very low, these spiraling winds may uh, reach storm or hurricane forces. This is why the term cyclone is often loosely applied to storms uh, generated by low pressure systems. So, for example, where would you think that you would see a lot of this uh, low pressure system with warm, moist air uh, rising up? That would be a, a good question to kind of think about. So there are two types of cyclones, and they develop in different ways and have different structures. A tropical cyclone develops over the ocean in warm, moist, tropical air, and they are characterized by very low air pressure at their center and are small in size. Uh, just about 100 to 600 miles in diameter. This means that they are very strong pressure gradient across the cyclone, and this can lead to very strong hurricane strength winds. Uh, we'll discuss tropical cyclones in greater detail in Chapter 7. Mid latitude cyclones 
are powered by large temperature differences in the atmosphere. And they develop where air masses of different temperatures meet. So the air masses don't mix together. Rather, the warm air is forced up and over the colder air. And this causes a front to form. Uh, Mid-latitude cyclones are much larger than tropical cyclones. And they have a diameter usually of 1,000 miles or so. And they also have uh, very low wind speeds, or have lower wind speeds. And we'll discuss mid-latitude cyclones in greater detail in Chapter 7. As so as we've seen, surface temperatures are higher at the equator than at the poles. And air can gain heat from the warm surroundings. Because air is free to move over the Earth's surface, it's reasonable to assume that an air circulation pattern like the one shown in this figure would develop over the Earth. In this ideal model, air heated at the tropics would expand and become less dense as it's rising in high altitude, it would turn polar, it would kind of pile up as it converges near the poles. Uh, the air would then cool and contract by kind of radiating heat in this space, sinking to the surface, and turn equatorial word, flowing along the uh, surface back to the tropics. And this can be seen here in this circuit that it's completing higher rising at the equator, cooling as it rises, and getting colder as it gets to the poles and then sinking at the poles, and then as it's flowing back towards the equator, it's slowly warming and kind of completes the circuit. But this is not what happens. Two factors govern global air circulation. One is the uneven solar heating, and two is the rotation of the Earth. So the westward, or excuse me, the eastward rotation of the Earth on its axis deflects the moving air or water or any moving object that has mass away from its initial course. And this deflection is called the Coriolis effect, which we've already discussed uh, previously. The circulation of air over the Earth is largely due to the unequal heating of the surface of the Earth. So that's important to know. Uh, the global circulation of pressure and winds plays this integral role in heat balance of the Earth, as well as creating global ocean currents. The global circulation of the atmosphere transfers warm air from the low latitudes towards the high latitudes, and cold air from the high latitudes towards the low latitudes. This exchange keeps the low latitude regions, uh, where there is a net gain of energy throughout the year from continually heating up, and the high latitudes from continually cooling due to the net loss of energy. However, if the Earth didn't rotate, the air would rise along the equator uh, equatorial regions and sink at the poles as shown in this figure. But we are lucky enough that the Earth does erode. So we can now modify our original model of atmospheric circulation from the previous slide into the more correct representation provided here. So yes, air does warm, it expands, and it rises at, at the equator. And air does cool, contrast, and fall at the poles. But instead of continuing all the way from the equator to the pole, in a continuous loop in each hemisphere, air rising from the equatorial region moves polar and gradually deflects eastward. That is, it turns to the right in the northern hemisphere, and air turns to the left in the southern hemisphere. The Coriolis effect causes this eastward deflection. And note that the Coriolis effect does not cause the wind, it only influences the wind's direction. As air rises at the equator, it loses its moisture by precipitation, or rainfall, caused by expanding and cooling. This drier air now grows denser in the upper atmosphere as it radiates heat to space and cools. When it has traveled about a third of the way from the equator to the pole, that is to about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitudes, the air becomes dense enough to fall back towards the surface. So most of this descending air turns back towards the equator when it reaches the surface. In the northern hemisphere, the Coriolis effect again deflects the surface air to the right, and the air blows across the ocean or land from the northeast. Uh, this air, the northeasterly trade, is uh, represented by the arrows in this figure. Uh, through compression, as heated it, uh, during this descent, this air is generally still colder than the surface over which it, it flows. And the air soon warms as it moves towards the equator. However, evaporating surface water, uh, it becomes much more humid. And the warm, moist, less dense air then begins
begins to rise as it approaches the equator and completes this the circle, or excuse me, the circuit. So such a large circuit of air is called an atmospheric circulation cell. And there are six of these cells in our model. Uh, a pair of cells exist at the tropics, uh, one on each side of the equator. And these are known as the Hadley cells in honor of George Hadley, who is a London lawyer and philosopher who worked out an overall scheme of wind circulation in, in 1735. But you don't need to worry about the dates or, or George Hadley's name, just know a Hadley cell. So look at, at them in this uh, figure between the equator and about 30 degrees north and south. A more complex pair of cir uh, circulation cells operates at the mid-latitudes in each hemisphere. Some of the descending air at 30 degrees latitude turns poleward rather than equatorialward. Before this air descends to the surface, air returning from the north joins it at a higher altitude. As the, you can see in this figure, a loop of air forms a mid-latitude cell between 30 degrees and about 60 degrees uh, north and south latitude. As before, the air is driven by this uneven heating and influenced by the Coriolis effect. Surface winds in this cell, uh, this circuit is again deflected to the right, this time flowing from the west to complete the circuit. These are the westerlies in this figure. The mid-latitude circulation cell uh, of each hemisphere is named uh, the Farrell cells after William Farrell. He was an American who discovered the inner workings in the mid-19th century. Meanwhile, air that has grown cold over the poles begins to blow toward the equator at the surface, turning to the west as it does so. Uh, between 50 and 60 degrees latitude in each hemisphere, this air has taken up enough heat and moisture to ascend. However, this pole air is denser than the air in the adjacent feral cell and does not mix easily with it. Uh, the unstable zone between these two cells uh, generates most mid-latitude weather. At high altitude, the ascending air from about 60 degrees latitude and turns polar to complete a third circuit. Uh, these are called the polar cells. So this six-cell model of the atmospheric circulation it's often returned, referred to as a three-cell model because you're just looking at one hemisphere as opposed to looking at both hemispheres at the same time. Uh, discussed above represents this average of airflow through many years over the planet as a whole. Um, though the uh, model is accurate in a general sense, local detail of cell circulations vary because surface conditions are different at different uh, longitudes. But for our, our purposes, this this model is, is sufficient. So sinking air, in contrast, is generally arid. Uh, the great deserts of both hemispheres, dry bands centered around 30 degrees latitude, uh, mark this intersection of the Hadley and the Feral Sail. Air falls towards the Earth's surface in these areas, causing this compressional heating. Because evaporation is higher than precipitation in these areas, Ocean surface salinity tends to be highest in these latitudes. At sea, these areas of high atmospheric pressure and little surface wind are called the subtropical high or worse latitudes, as called by the Spanish sailors because it was a region where ships were often calmed for days or weeks on end. And to conserve water, uh, the Spanish conquistadors would throw horses into the sea. So this figure summarizes the three-cell model as well as illustrates the various wind and associated precipitation. I just described the subtropical highs, so let's turn our attention to uh, the winds. The trade winds, or the easterlies as they are sometimes referred to, center at about 25 degrees north and south latitude. And the trade winds are the surface winds of the Hadley cell as they move from the horse latitude to the doldrums. So in the northern hemisphere, they are referred to as the northeasterly trade winds, and in the, the southeasterly trade winds uh, in the southern hemisphere. As you will note, winds are named from the direction from which they blow. The westerlies, surface winds of the feral cells, center at about 45 degrees north and south latitudes, and they flow between the horse latitudes and the boundaries of the polar cells in each hemisphere. The westerlies then approach from the southwest in the northern hemisphere and from the northwest in the southern hemisphere, as illustrated here. Uh, where the surface winds of the two 
pattern cells converge at the equatorial low is called the doldrums, or the intertropical conversion zone, ITCZ for short. To reflect this uh, influence of wind convergence on conditions near the equator, strong heating uh, along the ITCZ causes surface air to expand and rise. The humid rising, uh, expanding air loses moisture as rain, some of which contributes to the success of the tropical rainforest, and the airflow is characterized as a feeble and erratic winds. So here you can notice this band right around the equator. Uh, this is from this hot, moist uh, air rising, and as it rises, it cools and creates this uh, band of, of clouds around the ITCZ or around the equator. Um, which results in tropical rainforests and, and very wet climate. So the upper air westerlies are quite dominant from 30 to 60 degrees north and south of the equator. Within this region of the uh, atmosphere, there's also these two narrow zones in each hemisphere where the upper air westerlies become extremely fast. These, known, these zones are known as jet streams. In these narrow regions of the upper air westerlies, wind speeds accelerate because of the local presence of steep pressure gradients. As you recall, we talked about pressure gradients a few slides back. Uh, the upper left figure shows the relative position of the jet streams in each hemisphere. And note that these meandering bands of fast moving air are unbroken and circling the entire planet. The best known of these jet streams is called the polar jet stream. This jet stream was discovered around the time of World War II when airplanes began flying at higher altitudes. American pilots uh, flying bombing missions uh, to Japanese-occupied Pacific Islands occasionally encountered these winds on their flights. This encounter would often cause the plane to make little headway when they were flying westward and they were flying into the prevailing jet stream wind. On return flights, flying eastward uh, in direction back to the U.S. bases, Flight speeds would be accelerated because of the strong tail uh, wind produced by these jet streams. This is also why flying uh, to the west coast, from the west coast to the east coast, is much faster. The polar jet stream uh, occurs in these mid latitudes at an altitude between five and seven miles uh, high, and the width of the polar jet stream varies between uh, 60 and 300 miles, and the vertical thickness is usually between about 32, uh, well, 3,250 to 6,500 feet. Um, wind speeds at the core of these features often are greater uh, than 120 miles per hour to maximum speed, 